Ric Flair's origins are actually quite mysterious. It's believed that Flair was kidnapped as a child and put up for adoption in the infamous Tennessee Children's Home Society. However, Flair would be taken in by good parents. After being adopted, the future nature boy moved to Minnesota. There he discovered wrestling and instantly became hooked. Every year for his birthday, Flair would ask his parents to take him to shows. It wouldn't be until Ric Flair was out of college though that he got his step inside the ropes. The young nature boy met Vern Gagne, who was a wrestler and the owner of the American Wrestling Association, AWA. Ganya agreed to train Flair, but it wasn't easy. Vern was tough, and after the first day of training, Ric Flair almost quit. However, Flair toughed it out and made his debut in 1972. It didn't take long for people to notice that Ric Flair had the potential to be a big star. However, his entire career and life nearly came to an end. In October 1975, Flair was flying in a plane with a few other wrestlers. The aircraft ended up crashing and Rick broke his back. He was lucky to be alive and this would normally end someone's career, but not Ric Flair. Only three months later, the Nature Boy was back in the ring. However, he would have to change his wrestling style and use fewer power moves and focus more on grappling. This would help lead to the Nature Boy persona fans would become familiar with. Soon after this incredible comeback, Ric Flair would be noticed by WWE, which was known as the WWWF at the time. The company decided to see what this up and coming star was all about, leading to Ric Flair's first WWE match. One thing the Nature Boy should have used before his big debut was AG1 by Athletic Greens, the sponsor of this video. Now I have to be frank, I'm not the healthiest person in the world, but I'm trying to get better. So when Athletic Greens reached out, I was definitely interested. AG1 is a nutritional supplement that provides nutrients and phytonutrients that support and sustain healthy energy levels. All you do is take one scoop of AG1, mix it in with water, drink it, and you're good to go. I drink AG1 first thing in the morning, and it's definitely been beneficial. It's helped me combat drowsiness and low energy, which has in turn helped me stay focused on work and getting videos done. AG1 has kind of a coconut lime taste, and as I've gotten in the habit of drinking it, it's grown on me. Also, pro tip, use really cold water to help bring out the flavor. One thing I really like about AG1 is the amount you need to drink is pretty small, only 8 to 12 ounces of water each day. Again, I'm trying to be healthier, so this is an easy step to take. But what if you're already pretty healthy, or maybe you're an athlete? Is AG1 beneficial for you? Well, first off, that's great to hear. And second, yes. AG1 contains 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food source nutrients. All that in as little as 8 ounces of water. That's crazy. What's also crazy is the deal Athletic Greens is offering. Use my link in the description and get a one-year supply of immune supporting vitamin D3, K2, and five travel packs free with your first purchase. Your health affects everything you do, so don't wait. Give AG1 a try today. Inside the legendary Madison Square Garden, Ric Flair took on a man named Pete Sanchez. Once the bell rang, the two locked up, and Flair won the first test of strength. Sanchez fought back by flipping Rick onto his back, which prompted Flair to get more aggressive, and he began throwing punches. Sanchez was no pushover and grabbed a hold of the Nature Boy's arm and began wearing him down. Ric Flair fought out of Sanchez's hold, but Pete secured a second arm lock almost instantly. The Nature Boy struggled to free himself and the hold was doing more damage every second. Finally, Ric Flair ended the hold by throwing Pete Sanchez into the ropes, but Flair's opponent bounced right back and locked in another hold. Playing up his dirtiest player persona, Ric Flair fought back with a knee to the midsection. The Nature Boy began stomping on Pete Sanchez and then locked the man in his own hold. Once Sanchez was back on the ground, Ric Flair began pressing his knee into his opponent's skull and continued to work on the wrist lock. Flair threw some punches and strikes in there too as he wore down Pete Sanchez. The Nature Boy finally got outmatched when Sanchez flipped Ric Flair over and got out of the hold. This started a comeback for Pete and he began dishing out punches on Flair. Ric tried to stop it, but Pete Sanchez was fired up. Once Ric Flair was on the mat, Sanchez got his revenge by stomping the Nature Boy. Just like before, Flair used a knee to the midsection to get the match back in his favor. The future WWE Hall of Famer seemed to be in the driver's seat until his opponent dodged a standing elbow drop. Pete Sanchez used the opportunity to take back the match, and he threw Ric Flair into the turnbuckles, which caused Flair to do his iconic turnbuckle flip. However, Flair would catch his opponent with a kick to the face. He followed that up with a suplex that got the Nature Boy the win. You can tell this match is from a different era. This is still when wrestling was kind of trying to be a real sport, which is why the moves are so simple compared to today. It is interesting to see Ric Flair do things that would become a staple of his, like some of the moves he hit, and of course, the flip in the corner. It's hard to judge the match since it took place almost 50 years ago, but I thought it was alright. 
Ric Flair would have one more match in WWE a few months later, but then disappeared from the company. Flair ended up joining WWE's rival, the NWA. The Nature Boy spent the next 10 years there and would win the NWA World Heavyweight Championship in 1981. Flair went on to win the title another seven more times throughout his career, or more depending on who you ask. Anyways, during his time with the NWA, Ric Flair, along with Tully Blanchard, Arn Anderson, and Ole Anderson, formed the Four Horsemen, one of the most legendary factions in wrestling history. With each year that went by, Flair became more and more popular until he was arguably the biggest wrestler outside of WWE at the time. Things turned ugly though in 1991. The NWA had now joined with WCW, which was being run by a guy named Jim Hurd. Hurd wanted Flair to shave his hair and completely change his character. The Nature Boy, of course, was not excited about that, but the breaking point was when Jim Hurd wanted Flair to take a pay cut. Ric Flair had enough and left the NWA and WCW in 1991 while he was still World Heavyweight Champion. Not long after, Ric Flair would join WWE, about 15 years since he last appeared in the company. Most shocking was Flair brought with him the WCW World Title and began calling himself the Real World's Champion since he never lost the championship. Upon his arrival, Flair aligned himself with Bobby Heenan and Mr. Perfect and began issuing challenges to WWE's biggest stars. One of them was Rowdy Piper, and the two ended up facing off at Survivor Series, with each man captaining a four-man team. Flair's side won, but his night didn't end there. Later on, The Undertaker took on Hulk Hogan for the WWE Championship. Flair interfered, allowing the dead man to defeat Hogan and win the title. Taker and Hogan faced off just six days later in a rematch, where Ric Flair got involved again. This time though, the Hulkster was able to outsmart everyone and win back the title. However, due to all the outside interference, the WWE president, Jack Tunney, decided to strip Hulk Hogan of the title. Tunney then said that whoever would win the 1992 Royal Rumble match would become the new WWE champion. Ric Flair was one of 29 other wrestlers who entered the match. Despite being only the third man in, Ric Flair won and added the WWE championship to his list of accomplishments. Soon after, Ric Flair began claiming he used to be in a relationship with the Macho Man Randy Savage's wife, Miss Elizabeth, even showing pictures of them together. Macho Man became Macho Pissed and challenged Ric Flair to a championship match at WrestleMania 8. Even though Mr. Perfect was in his corner, the Nature Boy could not put Savage down and lost the WWE title. Despite the defeat, Ric Flair would go on a winning streak over the next few months. He would also continue to feud with the Macho Man during this time. At the 1982 SummerSlam, Randy Savage defended the WWE Championship against Against the Ultimate Warrior. During the match, Flair and Mr. Perfect both appeared ringside. They ended up causing trouble for both Savage and Warrior, and Flair would actually injure the Macho Man's leg. Macho Man would retain the title by countout, leading to a rematch between Ric Flair and Randy Savage three days later. The Nature Boy exploited Macho Man's still injured leg, and thanks to some interference from Razor Ramon, Flair was able to win and regain the WWE Championship. However, this tail reign was over pretty fast. At a non-televised WWE show, a little over a month later, Bret Hart defeated Flair to become the new WWE Champion. Since he still had some unfinished business with Randy Savage, a tag team match was set up, pitting Ric Flair and Razor Ramon against Macho Man and the Ultimate Warrior. However, Warrior would leave the company before the match took place. In need of a new partner, Randy Savage convinced Mr. Perfect to join him after making Perfect realize how poorly Bobby Heenan had treated him. At Survivor Series in 1992, the two teams faced off, with Ric Flair and Razor Ramon failing to defeat Macho Man and Mr. Perfect. After a few months, Ric Flair and Mr. Perfect would go one-on-one -on, -one on the January 25th, 1993 episode of Raw in a Loser Leaves WWE match. Flair was defeated by his former partner and was kicked out of WWE. The reason for Ric Flair's abrupt departure was because of a deal he had with Vince McMahon, where if Flair wasn't going to be used in the main event, he could leave WWE. Since that was going to happen, the Nature Boy said adios and went back to WCW. Just like how the Nature Boy worked with WWE's rival in the 80s, Flair did the same thing again in the 90s as the Monday Night War began to heat up. Unfortunately, the Nature Boy was on the losing side, and WCW shut down in 2001. About eight months later, Ric Flair would make his return to WWE. In the storyline, Shane and Stephanie McMahon 
McMahon sold their WWE stock to Ric Flair, making him the co-owner of the company with Vince McMahon. The two got on each other's nerves, ultimately setting up Ric Flair's first WWE match since his return. McMahon and Flair faced off in a street fight at the 2002 Royal Rumble. The Nature Boy won, proving to everyone he still had it. Afterward, Ric Flair got upset when The Undertaker attacked The Rock backstage, which is kind of ironic considering what Flair did years earlier in WWE. Anyways, this led to The Nature Boy causing the dead man a match against Rocky. In response, Undertaker challenged Ric Flair to a match at WrestleMania. Flair said he was just an owner now and wasn't going to wrestle. Not happy with Rick's answer, the Phenom began attacking Flair's friends and family until the wrestling legend agreed to a match at WrestleMania. While Ric Flair put up a good fight, his name wasn't Brock Lesnar, so he fell victim to the Tombstone Piledriver and lost. After this rivalry, Flair would return to his ownership responsibilities. He refereed a number of contenders match against Stone Cold Steve Austin and, ironically, The Undertaker at Backlash. The Undertaker won due to Rick not seeing Austin's foot touching the rope. At first, it seemed like Flair wanted to make amends, but he would later turn on Stone Cold and align himself with the Big Show. Steve Austin would get his revenge when he cost Ric Flair a WWE Championship match against Hulk Hogan on Raw. This ultimately led to a two-on-one handicap match between Flair and Big Show and the Texas Rattlesnake. Despite having the odds in his favor, a botch attack from X-Pac ended up costing Flair the match. Ric Flair and Steve Austin would have a one-on-one -on -one match soon after, where Stone Cold won again. To make matters worse, Ric Flair would lose his ownership of WWE when he lost to Vince McMahon in a rematch, thanks to Brock Lesnar interfering. The Nature Boy would start a short feud with the Beast, but was defeated twice, once in a singles match and once in a tag team match. From there, Flair would move on to another short feud with Chris Jericho that started when Jericho attacked Rick after Y2J had been moved from SmackDown to Raw. The two went one-on-one -on -one at the 2002 SummerSlam, and this time, Ric Flair got the win. With a bit of momentum, the Nature Boy was granted a World Heavyweight Championship match against Triple H. Unfortunately, Flair's victory at SummerSlam only got him so far. Things would get interesting at the next pay-per-view Unforgiven, when Triple H had a match against Rob Van Dam. Ric Flair came out during it, and at first, it looked like he was going to attack the game, but ended up taking out RVD instead. After this, Flair would become Triple H's manager and started accompanying him to the ring. It didn't end there though. Soon, Batista joined them, as well as Randy Orton. This then created a faction known as Evolution. For the first while, Ric Flair continued to be more of a manager for the group, but as time went on, he started wrestling more and more. He even fought Shawn Michaels for the first time at Bad Blood 2003 and won thanks to a little help from Randy Orton. However, Flair would take more of a backseat role and mainly help the other members of Evolution in their feuds, especially Triple H. At the Armageddon pay-per-view, the group would really show its dominance with every member winning a championship. For Ric Flair, he teamed up with Batista and won the World Tag Team Championship, the first time the Nature Boy had won a WWE title in 11 years. Going into 2004, Flair and the Animal would lose the tag titles to Booker T and Rob Van Dam in February. After that, the two had partnered with Randy Orton in his feud against Mick Foley. Foley, though, had reunited with The Rock, which set up a 2-on-3 handicap match at WrestleMania 20. Evolution was victorious that night and gave Ric Flair and Batista the momentum they needed for their World Tag Team title rematch. Eight days after WrestleMania, Flair and the Animal fought Booker and RVD again, and this time they won. While they had gold back around their waist, someone who didn't have any gold was Triple H, due to him losing the world title to Chris Benoit. This led to Ric Flair and Batista defending their world championship against Benoit and Edge. Unfortunately, like the game, they also lost their gold. After becoming titleless again, Ric Flair would go back to being more of a background character. He would mainly help Triple H in the game's pursuit to become World Heavyweight Champion champion again. Speaking of which, after Randy Orton won the title at SummerSlam, Flair, Triple H, and Batista all turned on the Legend Killer. This set up a match between H and Orton at Unforgiven, where Ric Flair interfered and helped the Cerebral Assassin become a champion again. For the rest of the year, Flair continued to aid Triple H, as well as fight Randy Orton, who was a little ticked off at Evolution. Unfortunately, this wasn't the only person who was going to get upset with the group. Batista won the 2005 Royal Rumble match, earning himself a World Championship match 
match at WrestleMania 21. Triple H and Flair tried to convince the Animal to challenge for the WWE Championship, however, Batista would ultimately choose Triple H as his WrestleMania opponent. The Nature Boy would do his best to help the game fight the Animal, but it didn't work and Batista became the new World Heavyweight Champion. Soon after WrestleMania, Evolution would end and Ric Flair was back on his own. He would become a good guy again and defeat the Intercontinental Champion Carlito at Unforgiven, and all seemed good. That was, until Triple H returned in October 2005. The two teamed up and won a tag team match against Carlito and Chris Masters. However, afterward, the game would attack the Nature Boy, kicking off a rivalry. The two first fought inside of a steel cage match at Taboo Tuesday, where Ric Flair won. They went one-on-one -on -one again at Survivor Series in a last man standing match. This time, Flair didn't fare so well and ended up crumbling to the game. Despite this loss, Flair's IC Championship was not on the line, so he continued to defend the title throughout the rest of 2005. Around this time, in real life, arrest warrants were issued for Ric Flair following a road rage incident. Flair was ultimately charged with two misdemeanors, and the incident would actually lead to a storyline in WWE. Edge had recently started a talk show called The Cutting Edge, and began mocking Ric Flair for the road rage incident. Ric Flair didn't take too kindly to the joke, and attacked the radar superstar. At New Year's Revolution, Flair and Edge would go one-on-one -on -one for Ric's Intercontinental Championship. However, Edge attacked the Nature Boy with his Money in the Bank briefcase and was disqualified. Ric Flair and Edge would meet once more eight days later in a tables, ladders, and chairs match, where this time Edge was the decisive winner. However, like with Triple H, the IC title wasn't on the line, so Ric Flair remained champion. His time as champ, though, finally came to an end in February 2006, when the Nature Boy was defeated by Shelton Benjamin. Flair didn't manage to win back the Intercontinental Championship, but he did qualify for the Money in the Bank match at WrestleMania 22. Unfortunately, that didn't work out too well for the Nature Boy. Soon after, Ric Flair would take a break from WWE. When he returned, he began a rivalry with Mick Foley, someone who Flair legitimately had heat with backstage. The two legends took shots at each other, with Ric Flair calling Foley a glorified stuntman, while Mick called Flair a washed up piece of crap. They had a best two out of three falls match at Vengeance, where the Nature Boy beat the hardcore legend in two straight falls. The two went at it once more at SummerSlam in an insanely bloody I quit match. Flair would threaten to attack Molina, who had come out to help Foley, which made Mick say, I quit. After beating Mick Foley 2 to none, Ric Flair would be in feuding with the Spirit Squad. He teamed up with Roddy Piper, and they managed to beat the male cheerleaders for the World Tag Team Championship. The victory was short-lived, as eight days later, Rick and Rowdy lost the titles to Flair's old rivals, Edge and Randy Orton. That didn't stop the Nature Boy, though, from leading a team of WWE legends to defeat the Spirit Squad at Survivor Series. In early 2007, Ric Flair would start an interesting storyline with Carlito. It began when Ric Flair got angry at Carlito for leaving a WWE show early, and said the Apple Man had no heart. Flair and Carlito would soon have a one-on-one -on -one match that the Nature Boy won. They then formed a tag team with Ric Flair mentoring Carlito. Unfortunately, they would suffer their fair share of losses, and there was ongoing conflict between them. Just as their tag team got started, it ended when Ric Flair and Carlito began fighting each other during a match. The former tag team partners decided to go one-on-one -on -one again at Judgment Day, with the Nature Boy getting the better of the Apple Man. After his rivalry with Carlito, Ric Flair would be drafted to SmackDown. Flair's first order of business was to challenge the United States Champion, MVP. Flair got his title match at Vengeance, but got outplayed when MVP low blowed him and won. While things didn't quite go according to the Nature Boy's plan, things picked up when he realigned himself with Batista. Unfortunately, shortly after the Evolution teammates got back together, Flair would get injured during a match with the Great Khali. He spent a few months away from WWE, and when he came back, he was on Raw. Upon his return, Ric Flair gave a speech talking about his future and retirement, only to announce that he would never retire. This got the attention of Vince McMahon, who said that if Ric Flair lost any singles matches, he'd be forced into retirement. Over the next several months, almost every match Ric Flair was a part of was heart pounding, knowing that one defeat would end his career. However, this didn't stop the Nature Boy from challenging Shawn Michaels to a match at WrestleMania 24. HBK was reluctant at first, but eventually agreed. Not to spoil anything, but this would be Ric Flair's last match in WWE. 
While both men got a great ovation, the fans were definitely the loudest for Ric Flair. Once the match started, Flair began with a bit of showboating, but Michaels got him back by hitting the first offensive move. The two then started grappling and went back and forth with who was in control. Michaels tried to fight out of Flair's hold with elbows, but Ric Flair caught Mr. WrestleMania with a hip toss. The match then started turning personal, with Rick and Sean yelling at each other and slapping one another. Speaking of slapping, Flair started dishing out his signature chops on HBK. Michaels tried to fight out of it, but ended up getting a boot to the face, just like Pete Sanchez over 30 years earlier. Flair's momentum was briefly derailed when Michaels nailed him with a hard elbow, but the Nature Boy got it back on track when he threw his opponent off the top turnbuckle. Flair then took to the skies with the crossbody and tried to lock in the figure four, but got literally booted out of the ring. Mr. WrestleMania then connected with a baseball slide to Flair, but completely missed a moonsault and ate the announcer's table. HBK made it back into the ring, but the botched move had done some serious damage. Flair didn't give Michaels a second of recovery and kept wailing on him. Despite all the abuse, Shawn Michaels still stayed in the match. Ric Flair then dished out a second serving of chops, followed by a spectacular standing suplex. Shawn Michaels finally caught up to Flair when the showstopper hit the Nature Boy with a neckbreaker. Michaels followed this up by giving Ric Flair a hard throw to the outside and then hit a moonsault from the top rope that definitely connected. Despite that, both men had to crawl to get back into the ring. The two legends began trading chops, which ended when Michaels rammed his elbow into Ric's face. Mr. WrestleMania then hit two atomic drops on the Nature Boy, followed by a body slam onto the mat, and ending with the showstopper's signature elbow drop from the top rope. HBK started tuning up the band, but stopped himself before he hit Ric Flair, which allowed Flair to execute the figure four leg lock. Michaels was able to get out of the hold, which led to the two icons starting to grapple again and going for the pin. When that didn't end the match, Ric Flair catapulted Shawn Michaels into the opposite turnbuckle, leading to Shawn Michaels' signature flop, something Ric Flair did years before Shawn Michaels was even a wrestler. Flair took out his opponent's left leg and tried to lock in the figure four. The first attempt wasn't successful, but the second one was. Ric Flair kept Shawn Michaels locked in for 50 seconds until Shawn caused a rope break. After failing to get the tap out, Ric Flair started getting vicious and sloppy. This created an opening for the Heartbreak Kid to hit Sweet Chin music, but Ric Flair somehow kicked out. Michaels got ready to hit a second one, but Flair wouldn't get up. Frustrated, Shawn Michaels walked over to the Nature Boy, which allowed Ric Flair to low blow HBK. However, Shawn Michaels countered with his own version of the figure four leg lock, but Flair managed to reach the rope and get a thumb to the eye as well. Once both men were on their feet, Ric Flair began serving up chops, but from out of nowhere, Shawn Michaels hit sweet chin music. Instead of going for the pin, Michaels got ready to hit a second one, but was hesitant. Ric Flair motioned for Shawn to bring it, so the showstopper did and put an end to one of the most legendary careers careers in wrestling history. Sort of. I can't really add anything that's already been said. This match is spectacular. It does seem like it doesn't get talked about as much though, and I think that might be because of Shawn Michaels and Undertaker's match at the following WrestleMania overshadowing it. Despite that, this is still a phenomenal match, and is in the top tier of last matches. The entire storyline of Ric Flair's career being on the line in every single match was great too. One thing that I find fascinating about Ric Flair's last WWE match is how much the world evolved since his first. Just look at his first WWE match in 1976 compared to his last in 2008. The quality of the footage speaks for itself. Anyways, while this would be Ric Flair's last match in WWE, he would compete a few more times, mainly in TNA between 2010 and 2011. More recently, Ric Flair is stepping out of retirement again at the age of 73 for a match at StarCast during SummerSlam weekend. Like the man said, that I will never retire! <laughs> you don't have to retire either. From watching Bell to Bell, that is, hit this playlist to watch every Bell to Bell video.